Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our next installments in the Bunky Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. <clears throat> On behalf of all my partners at the Bunky Clinic, Drs. Greg Bunky, Rudy Buntik, uh, Andrew Watt, and Walter Lin, I'd like to <clears throat> um, introduce a, a very dear friend of ours and a very dear friend of mine, Professor Bruno Battistone uh, from Torino, Italy. He'll be speaking to us today on the mangled lower limb. Just by way of background, uh, Professor Battiston obtained his MD from the Torino University Medical School. He then completed his residency in orthopedics um, at the Torino University Medical School, followed by a PhD in microsurgery at the Pavia University Med Medical School, followed by hand surgery, which he studied under Professor Brunelli, who um, obviously is a giant in the field. He uh, then became the head of microsurgery at the Center for Orthopedic Traumatology in Torino, uh, from 2001 to 2008, and since 2009, he's been the head of trauma um, and hand surgery um, and the microsurgery unit at CTO Hospital in Torino. Um, he's a past president of the Italian Society of Microsurgery, past president of the Italian Society for Surgery of the Hand, and he's a past general secretary of um, the European Federation of Societies of Microsurgery. He's also an honorary member of the U Yugoslavian Orthopedic Society, the Romanian Society for Microsurgery, and the Indian Society of Plastic Surgery as well. Um, he's offer, offered, authored over 170 peer-reviewed papers. By now, it's probably over 200. And Bruno is, uh, is uh, now in our series of uh, visiting professors from Northern Italy. Um, it, for those of you who have been with us for the last few weeks, last couple of months, we had our, our good friend Marco Innocenti from Florence uh, presented his experience with fibula flaps. Just last week, we had Professor Adani from Modena, um, Italy, present. <clears throat> we had uh, Pierluigi Tos from Milan give us a great talk on replantation. And of course, we have another giant of Italian hand and microsurgery, Professor Battiston from Torino today, discussing his experience with uh, the mangled lower limb. Um, I had the privilege of visiting uh, Bruno and his team in Torino last year during my travels, and it was really a fantastic experience, and, and, and I learned quite a bit. CTO Hospital is really a, um, a, one of the busiest hospitals with regards to extremity trauma, um, and I got to spend a fair amount of time with uh, Bruno, not only in clinic, but also in the operating room. You'll recognize um, Dr. Tuss from this picture as well. He used to be in Torino with Dr. Bat Batisan for a number of years before he went down to, to Milan. Um, to, to become the head of uh, hand there. Um, I was able to actually watch quite a few very interesting cases. Um, Bruno did uh, a fibula for, uh, for ulnar reconstruction. Um, he did a number of uh, nerve cases like uh, radial to axillary nerve transfer. And they had a number of lower extremity limb salvage cases, um, distal radius fractures, all sorts of really um, the, whole, the whole spectrum, if you will. Um, of upper extremity and also lower extremity trauma. So it's really a, a, um, a service that's second to none. I was also able to share some of our experience in replantation during this trip and also spend some time um, seeing some patients uh, in, in clinic as well. Uh, one of the highlights of the trip, um, we actually did a, um, uh, I was able to observe a very innovative nerve transfers being done in a cadaver lab uh, by Dr. Batistón and one of his partners, uh, Paolo Titolo great guy, and I spent some time in the clinic with him as well, so that was really fun. And of course, um, I'd be remiss with that if, if I didn't mention the um, typical Italian hospitality that, that we've all gotten to know and, 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 and appreciate. Uh, Bruno was kind enough and his, and his wonderful wife to have me over for dinner, and I really had a multi-course feast of, of, of incredible food and drinks um, from, from all over Italy, but also but specifically from the Piemonte region. One thing I, knew, I learned, uh, Bruno taught me a lot in this trip. It, it wasn't just about surgery. I also learned about the uh, uh, the birthplace, if you will, of, of the delicious Italian white truffles, obviously, from the Piemonte region. Uh, Torino and that area is also home to the Gianduia uh, chocolate, the hazelnut chocolates. Uh, so those of us who really enjoy these uh, d delicious treats, we have Torino to thank for it. And Torino also, I found out, is the birthplace and the home of Nutella. Um, so we all grew up with this, and it was really fascinating for me to learn that it actually was the, the headquarters are there as well. And then the other thing of a little pop culture um, was that the the chain Italy was actually also started um, in in Torino, and there was one right across my hotel, uh, which was really fun. As a uh, diehard uh, football fan, um, obviously Torino is also home to the Ju Juventus uh, team, um, which has really dominated Itali Italian Serie A football. 
Um, my first night when I arrived, Bruno picked me up and we actually went to a, a really fun pub with a, lot, a number of his friends who are in this kind of social club and dinner club together. And we actually watched a live um, Ju Juventus match, which they actually they, they went on and win. So that was another really fun kind of part of that trip. With that, Bruno, thank you so much again for being with us. Um, it's really an honor to have you, and we're all greatly looking forward to hearing your experience on lower limb um, salvage and the mangled lower extremity. So thanks a lot to you, uh, because uh, this invitation is, is important for me to be really part of your activity. And uh, I know that you have a number of people uh, coming for this uh, virtual uh, webinars. And so it's an honor for me to be with you. Uh, and uh, thanks again for your friendship. Uh, and uh, I'll try to, uh, to share with you uh, my experience. Uh, even if I'm mainly a hand surgeon, I'm also a microsurgeon doing reconstructive microsurgery. So I proposed uh, the topic of uh, uh, treatment of, uh, of the mangled lower limbs. Uh, do you uh, see my, my screen? Um, I don't see it yet, but if you, um, it worked before. So if you press the screen button down below, you should be able to share the desktop. Okay, uh, I'll try because now I... Let's see here. There we go. Yeah, I can see your computer now. So if you, uh, yep, I can see PowerPoint. And if you go full screen, Full screen. Be able to share. Yep. And then you can hide that bar down below by clicking on the right, the bar. You can hide that. Perfect. Oops. And you can just minimize it, go to meeting window. Okay. Yep. Perfect. It's perfect for you. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So I, I start my presentation and uh, uh, I, sh I shift this because, of course, you, you presented uh, uh, my city. That I, I just uh, add something about the fact that Torino was the first capital of Italy because the Savoyas kings uniting Italy, they started in Torino because they were kings of Torino and they united Italy. So Torino is really important for I I Italy unification. And of course, you mentioned Juventus, Nutella, but don't forget uh, Cinquecento and Fiat because the Fiat factory is just there. So let's talk about, about uh, mental limbs. And uh, of course, uh, this, uh, the approach of the lesion uh, and this lesion particularly is a teamwork where anesthesiologist, orthopedic, microsurgeon, and plastic surgeon, they work together. Uh, of course, uh, these patients need an initial correct pre-hospital care. And uh, at the hospital arrival, as you see uh, upstairs, the mangled lower limbs uh, in patients with, with complex trauma are not the first priority. And the actual golden rule is to adopt the DCO, the damage control orthopedic strategy, preserving a life before limb. Uh, yes, because uh, in, in order to avoid to carry just a part of the body. And uh, one of the most critical part of our job is to give a correct indication, especially in severe cases as complete amputation of a limb. Even for a simple amputation, uh, we may have several advantages. As you see here, short re recovery time if you amputate and put a prosthesis, uh, a reduced number of complications uh, for uh, complex surgery, number of operations, the hospital rest, and uh, the social costs are, are, are less. And then the decision to reconstruct uh, is to be taken following some recommendation. Here you see several scoring salvage indices trying to help the surgeon in such a difficult task. Between them, MESS is the most known uh, mangled extremity severity score and used. However, MESS has some limitations, a poor consideration of so soft tissue problems uh, because done from an orthopedic surgeon and consideration of tibial nerve lesion as contraindication for reconstruction, but then all lower limb amputation, complete amputation, should be considered not to be treated. Nonetheless, microsurgeons may repair a tibial nerve in a way leading to plantar sensibility recovery. Then, for us, replantation is possible. 
This is the reason why, based on our experience, we built a scoring system considering, uh, co as you see, several factors, so age, uh, etc., and severity uh, of uh, general condition, uh, but mainly soft tissue problems. The highest score is given to a severe tibial nerve lesion as an avulsion, so not just a tibial nerve uh, cut, but an avulsion, not being a contraindication, but influencing a lot the final score. Then we have a contraindication to reconstruction with scores superior to eight. With scores between six and seven, we may consider replantation, but knowing that we may end with a poor final result. This score has been accepted in several journals and books as based on one of the largest series in literature and is now internationally adopted, as you see many uh, books and papers presenting our scoring system. So, of course, you have to respect some surgical rules, uh, especially in the lower um, limb amputation, you need immediate shortening to reduce the uh, problem uh, of uh, necrosis of infections following surgery and mainly systemic complication, so crush syndrome, ischemia, and uh, you make easier your uh, uh, microsurgical sutures. Then you have to elementarize, that means reduce the mass of the muscles because the leg has a lot of muscles. So you have to keep just the, the muscle for uh, essential uh, walking. Then of course, fasciotomies are really important. Uh, here you see a case of, of 18 years old guy with a, a right foot amputation by circular saw. And you see that uh, uh, the, the, the patient is treated by means uh, of an external fixation. And uh, uh, as you see, the shortening is treated afterwards during the uh, healing of the bone, changing the fixator, making a proximal compactotomy, and then uh, lengthening the leg while the patient was healing. So at the end, we have uh, a perfect healing uh, end, uh, of the replanted parts, and you see, that you have also the symmetry and no problem of uh, a hypometric limb. So uh, in our case series of 23 uh, uh, cases in 20 patients, three bi bilateral, we of course had to shorten limb in the majority of them with uh, seven major uh, problems. So needing uh, seven uh, lengthenings. And uh, then uh, we adopted the uh, Elizarov's concept uh, uh, using uh, the classical callus destruction. As you see, for example, in this uh, very young lady, 17 years old, with a right foot amputation for a train accident, you see the, the kinds of uh, marginal necrosis, but at the end, the uh, monoaxial fixator was changed in a circle one, allowing step by step uh, very long uh, lengthening and you see uh, the, the final result in terms of perfect uh, uh, normometry and uh, uh, callus formation and healing of the bone, of the tibia. So uh, we had also problems, not just of uh, lengthening, but also of non-unions, two cases. So again, uh, the Elizaro system allowed us to heal uh, in six and eight months the, the problem. Here you see uh, bilateral amputation. So in bilateral amputation, you don't need to, to, to lengthen because you, you of course, adjust the, uh, the length of, of, uh, of your reconstruction. And you see here the, the other limb. Uh, here are the X-ray pictures. And uh, you see the patient some days afterwards. And here, uh, while uh, he is treated for the uh, delayed healing, uh, and for this uh, non-union on the left side uh, by means of this Elizarov system, leading to a final perfect healing and uh, allowing the patient to, to walk, even if the face is not satisfied. But uh, anyway, it was a, a psychiatric patient, so not needing any more uh, kind of help for, uh, in the getting back to normal life. Uh, afterwards, uh, we can have uh, conjoint problems, uh, for example, limb shortening and necrosis. Uh, in this case, uh, this uh, uh, complete amputation on one side seemed not, not so bad, but if you look at the X-rays, it means that it, uh, this car accident was a very high energy injury with a score of six. So let's see what, what will be the, uh, the treatment and, uh, and the final result, but the patients really asked us to reconstruct. The, uh, the, this patient was uh, polytrauma, as you see here, uh, also some uh, pelvic and uh, contralateral limb problems. And you see, uh, finally, reconstructing the, the, uh, 
uh, the limb, uh, we had a shortening of eight centimeters and a big necrosis afterwards. Uh, it seems uh, that we had to amputate at this point, but the patient asked again, please, doctor. Uh, and and stra very strange, uh, the, the foot was very well vascularized and the only structure li really in continuity was the neurovascular uh, posterior tibial uh, part of, of the leg. And you see, we did a very large lattice free latissimus dorsal flap covering. And then five months afterwards, we started with uh, Elizarov. This is the picture uh, eight months later, 14 months later. And you see that uh, the proximal lengthening led to uh, uh, the um, uh, final uh, uh, healing uh, of, of the callus formation. And uh, the final healing here is not so good, the, 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 uh, the X-ray picture, but the patient, the young patient was really satisfied and uh, went on a journey because uh, she declared that uh, she went back to a disco. So uh, you see that external fixation solved uh, a lot of problems in our patients and the, the limb lengthenings did not interfere with replantation, renovation and healing. So that, that means that uh, external fixation was well tolerated in, in these uh, very severe uh, lesions, even if uh, bul bulky and needing dressing. But uh, having a really uh, big advantage, uh, that means versatility during treatment. So uh, for us and for our experience, uh, secondary lengthening allows lower limb replantation, even in presence of a big bone loss, so when you have to shorten a lot, and here, the, the first really big message I want to give you that uh, microsurgery and traditional orthopedic techniques are not really uh, enemies, but you have to integrate them uh, to get the fantastic results. Uh, but what uh, when you have a mangled, uh, but very well vascularized lower limb, again, uh, the uh, decision, initial decision is critical. Even for generally in the emergency department, you have young surgeon uh, then uh, really discussing uh, if reconstruct or amputate. Uh, especially in this, uh, in this patient, you see, it seems uh, a very severe case, but finally it's well vascularized. And, and you see that uh, with a normal treatment uh, for a normal open fracture, uh, the patient healed perfectly, as you see here in this X-ray picture. Then we have to follow uh, something that is not really new because Gastillo published in 1990 that all open fractures are emergencies, especially in lower limbs. Then uh, you have to do a good damage control. You have to give it antibiotics. Uh, you have to debride. And uh, uh, of course, fracture to stabilize the fracture. But then timing uh, is a critical point because uh, uh, these uh, patients have to be treated immediately in an emergency room as soon as possible because uh, uh, according to all the literature, even to Genodi's experience, open fracture should be operated immediately within six hours. Uh, but uh, remember to radically debride because you have to do a kind of oncological excision of all necrotic and doubtful tissues, even uh, if preserving longitudinal structures. Because we don't need to have these patients that uh, was referred to us with uh, foreign bodies again inside uh, the, the, uh, uh, the wound. Then uh, what about the good debridement uh, for the bone? Uh, papers are not really, we have not the evidence-based medicine because uh, we have a recent paper, you see 2008, uh, that say no bone fragments should be discarded even if avascular. But what to do if you have a, a really avascular uh, tibial segment, as you see, uh, the contaminated that can be uh, removed because if not, you will have infection there. So uh, timing for reconstruction, of course, immediate reconstruction is considered the gold standard. But of course, timing of reconstruction is also dependent on timing of patient referral. And so do we follow uh, Mr. Bone that declared that uh, early total care uh, some years ago was the golden rule? Uh, we think that actually in this complex uh, high energy injuries, we have to follow the damage control concept in orthopedics because uh, we have uh, a second hit generally given by uh, uh, um, severe surgical procedure and uh, you may break the balance of the general status of the patient uh, um, directing the patient to MODS or ARDS and then uh, pay, pay attention because uh, 
The second hit phenomenon is a danger because fracture surgery performed uh, completely in an immunosuppressed state can be deleterious to the patient. Then perhaps we have to wait some days, not so much. Generally, they say after day four, uh, up to day seven. And what about the problem of soft tissue? Because we, uh, they are crucial for us. Uh, we think we are orthoplastic surgeons. We, we don't care just about bone or just about, about uh, uh, skin. So uh, as you see, people, again, no evidence-based me medicine because people say there is no rational and immediate complete wound closure. Why a lot of papers are on uh, uh, VAC uh, or synthetic membranes to, to treat afterwards uh, uh, the bone problems. Uh, then which is the best moment? Uh, of course, uh, in emergency, uh, uh, that means uh, inside 24 hours is the best period because uh, we, we have no inflammation, no granulation tissue, no fibrosis, and a minimal vascular risk uh, for our vascular reconstruction. But perhaps early uh, seems to be a reasonable time because uh, if you have such a patient during the night, it's better to, to do it in the morning if you, if you have a good surgeon that really is not really tired. So uh, what about five, seven days? Uh, again, no EBM, uh, because you see um, a lot of authors uh, described uh, um, as emergency um, uh, five days after, one day after, three days. But we think that Godina, again, uh, who had a large experience and still was uh, mastering this surgery, uh, declared that three days may be a good uh, a compromise to uh, cover if you do a good debridement except some indication for um, emergency flaps. You have uh, an absolute indication if you have uh, vital structure is exposed, you have uh, a high risk of infection. You may use some, some part of the amputated part as a flow through flaps or salvage flaps. Perhaps relative indications are definitive functional and aesthetic results. But let's look to this amputation very close to the knee. That means that if you amputate this patient, because, of course, the, the, the distal part you see is avulsed with the real difficult possibility uh, to get a good integrity. In fact, the score is 10 according to our uh, scoring system. Then we know that, that there is uh, some kind of a, a contraindication. But, well, uh, if you amputate, we amputate at thigh level. Then for a motorcycle ascent, we decide to use a part of, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the foot with the calcaneus to lengthen in a one step uh, the tibia as you see here, covering uh, the stump and getting back uh, for, uh, with a good stump ready for uh, um, a prosthesis. Uh, and you see the quality of uh, uh, knee flexion extension 80 days afterwards. And uh, then which bone fixation? Best option depends on, the, of course, on type of fracture. There are no strict rules, site of the fracture and the site of soft tissue loss and of course, general health conditions. If you have uh, a patient to be treated Im immediately and stabilized, uh, external fixation may be the, the, the best way. And you um, see, for example, uh, these two um, type of synthesis, this is to be, uh, of course, uh, abolished because uh, this kind of uh, uh, nail, uh, bridging nail, uh, leaving, um, I, I don't know what, is, is absolutely crazy. So uh, we, we put uh, X, X fix, uh, and uh, if uh, changing a, an X fix with the nail is accepted uh, in the literature, why not changing an external fixation monoaxial put in an emergency with another one? Uh, look at this patient. You see uh, the uh, severe loss of bone and soft tissues. And then with the Lizarov method, the, the, the leg was covered by a, a gracilis free flap, and, uh, and you see that uh, changing the fixator with, with a, uh, a ring system, you may uh, really get back to uh, from a bifocal uh, compatotomy. You see proximal and distal. You can uh, meet the two pieces of bone. Uh, finally, having a good healing, you see here the uh, double um, uh, callus dis destruction and the perfect healing of the patient. And is microsurgery of any help? Then I, I choose some way of, uh, of thinking. Of, co of course, you see the, fir the first three steps, uh, you have to surgical the brine, and then you have a bone and soft tissue loss. What to do? You have to do a free muscle or cutaneous flap, and then you may use distraction osteogenesis as I, as I showed you. Again, a case uh, with uh, 
it seems not uh, such a, a big problem for the bone but you have uh, it's a high energy injury especially for the soft tissue so a uh, very large uh, necrosis then uh, we remove the infected bone and uh, we, we, we put uh, some days afterwards a uh, latissimus dorsi free flap we change the fixator again with, with a destruction here you see uh, the final destruction and uh, and the healing and this is a solution Again, uh, you can do also a flap or uh, using some uh, kind of bone transfer, again, with the external fixation. For example, this is a patient you see again with a, a loss of uh, soft tissues. And here the, the, the bone contaminated and a vascular bone that is removed. A gracilis uh, free flap is put on, on this patient. And again, you see the uh, uh external fixation that is uh, for the moment just keeping uh the, the length of, the, of and is changed afterwards with the complex uh, ring system uh, as the uh, uh, fibula was intact uh, the fibula is transferred to the tibia you see the way so at the end uh, uh, the patient is walking and because the uh, uh, lizard system is very stable allow the patient to walk and walking at the same time really uh, makes the callus uh, really hypertrophy, as you see here. And if, if you have stability, this is the first slide. The second concept I, I want to uh, really underscore is that if you have uh, good stability, also uh, some uh, left periosteum can do callus. As you see here, uh, with uh, you see the arrow that is showing the callus given by the periosteum and the fibula is, uh, the transfer fibula is vascularized and is doubled if you look at the left fibula. So 20 months later, the patient is perfectly walking on his foot. Again, if you have just a bone problem, then you can do a free bone flap. And again, external fixation for us in the lower limb is crucial. Here you see a big bone loss. The bone was on the highway, was left on the highway, distal part of the femur. Here you see that uh, the fibula is, is put, and uh, again, um, the, the, the quality of uh, uh, callus formation, not only the fibula, but also the periosteum, the left periosteum, uh, restoring perfectly also the shape of the distal femur. So we, consider, we are considering a new approach, and I suggest you, uh, generally in literature, you, you see very uh, few series uh, uh, making an acute bone reconstruction acute i mean i mean uh, one week later but when we have such a kind of high energy injury with bone contamination th this is to be considered as a bone loss uh, you see uh, the, uh, this is also a gastil 3 uh, fracture then of course uh, damage control so keeping uh, the length and you see the the loss of bone and one week later uh, a free fibula is transferred you see the reconstruction, uh, the, the vascular repair. And uh, look at the two rings, because the fibula is, is put inside the, the, the proximal part of the femur, so that you can, uh, uh, this is real, um, the quality and the possibility of the external fixation. Then you can uh, uh, use uh, the external fixation so to lengthen uh, the distal femur, because uh, the fibula is free then uh, glide inside uh, the distal femur and at the end you have uh, also restoration of, of the uh, the original length uh, while you have a perfect callus formation of the fibula and as you see also of the periosteum that is that was left there you see then afterwards a perfect healing uh, in 14 months period and here you see the patient seems uh, a patient having a normal femur fracture uh, this is a case of uh, the tibia bone loss that is uh, stabilized, damage control with a monoaxial fixator, uh, an Offerman type. And again, uh, you see the, the, the complex uh, uh, ring system. Again, the patient, uh, while healing, uh, uh, broke uh, the, um, uh, the, the healing the tibia. As you see here, a new fixator was put. And, and you see that... Uh, at the removal of the fixator, we have a perf perfect uh, fibular hypertrophy, but also you see the quality 
of uh, um, uh, periosteum uh, uh, callus formation. Then, if you have a combined abundance of tissue loss and they are severe, you can consider a combined free flap. As you see in this case of uh, a gunshot injury, uh, no, no, sorry, a car accident, uh, losing uh, the fourth and, and fifth metatarsal with complete loss of soft tissue on the dorsum. And we consider after the breedment, uh, one week later, uh, reconstruction by means of a growing flap uh, where combined uh, uh, osteomuscle muscle flap. And, and you see here it is fixed and covered by a, a, a thin uh, skin. Uh, and, and you see uh, the bone block really allowing uh, the reconstruction of the, uh, the metatarsal formula. And uh, uh, You see one year post-op, you see that the, the block of bone is completely integrated and you see, here you see the patient that is able to get better also uh, on, uh, on a perfect uh, walking on the tip of the foot. So uh, uh, I finish with uh, secondary problems in, in this uh, mangled lower limb because they, as you saw, especially in amputated parts, you may have bone necrosis or chron chronic uh, osteomyelitis. So what to do uh, uh, according to uh, our experience? Uh, do we reconstruct in one or two stages? And uh, literature say that muscle flaps are the first choice, but there is not really uh, some evidence. And so we think that also fascial and fascial cutaneous flaps can be useful. But uh, if you see at our series, uh, we did 70% uh, of cases, two stage reconstruction. So first stage resection of the necrotic or infected bone eventually covering with muscle or cutaneous uh, flaps in the first stage, and then a secondary bone transfer, and the second one some months later, generally three, four months, when uh, uh, according to uh, the uh, local and general conditions. This is a patient who was treated um, for a gastrilo-3 uh, problem at the distal femur, treated several times, I tell you, six uh, operation uh, with the, just Elizarov, trying to, to just to to move some, some, some bone, uh, and uh, unfortunately, you see the, the problem of, in, of infection. When we were asked to, to treat this patient, uh, the patient told us, uh, please doctor, last, last treatment, because I cannot tolerate, I, pref I prefer to be amputated uh, if it fail. So one shot, we decided to do in one step, the treatment and double vascularized fibular graft, one pedicle reverse and one free, here you see the, the pedicle is an osteocutaneous uh, uh, fibula flap uh, covering so the, the loss of, of, uh, of skin. And, uh, and you see here uh, the good healing of the free fibula uh, that was mounted as a kind of uh, tripodal way, in a tripodal way. This is the pedicle one. And uh, here is the starting point uh, at the end of the operation and the final healing with the patient getting back uh, to his normal life. Again, uh, a problem of uh, mainly of bone, necrotic bone, a very large uh, necrotic bone. Do we leave it? No, we have to resect it. First step, the treatment and local pedicle flap coverage, as you see here. Uh, a kind of oncological excision, you have to be sure to resect all the uh, contaminated infected bone. Here it is the Fibula and again the uh, ring system, the Lizaro system allow such a stability and anyway uh, an elastic stability. So allowing the patient uh, uh, to to walk to walk on on his system. So getting back to some normal life and you see that while walking the fibula hypertrophy. You see the it it, it is doubled. Again another another patient a very uh, uh, very difficult case because bilateral problem amputated on one side in another hospital and which uh, with this kind of uh, infected uh, exposed bone on the left side do we amputate also this this uh, left leg we decided to reject all the necrotic bone this patient was referred to us uh, uh, some months later eh? Uh, then the first step, uh, the treatment and free gracilis flap that was uh, uh, withdraw from, of course, from the um, already damaged uh, uh, limb, so from the right side. 
And you see here the, the gracilis flap at the end of the operation and some weeks later. Then uh, the second step with the fibula, from, of course, uh, from, the, from the same side, and the free, free fibula transfer, you see the healing took some time. By the end, you, you have a patient uh, needing just uh, a prosthetic re replacement uh, on just on the right side, very satisfied with his wife. So I hope that uh, these uh, cases and my way of thinking, that this is a compromise between uh, immediate tre treatment and uh, uh, damage control cups that, uh, uh, that uh, try to uh, give you uh, a good way of approaching the problem of these uh, severe mangled limbs. Thanks a lot. Bruno, thank you so much. Um, this was a uh, such a fun talk for, for me in particular to, um, to watch because our philosophies in lower extremity salvage um, are actually very much aligned. And it's always good to see. Um, I, I already knew that our philosophies in replantation were very um, close and, and, and aligned. And I think um, it's definitely the same with, with lower, lower extremity. We are um, fortunate here um, to be able to work with um, Dr. David Lohenberg, who was <clears throat> one of Elizarov's trainees. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we absolutely agree with you in, in the power of the Elizarov technique in these complex limb salvage operations. Um, when you have an orthopedic surgeon um, such as your team uh, or for us, David Lohenberg, the, with a really severe trauma, the orthopedic surgeon is not afraid of doing a very aggressive resection of any bone that appears devitalized. And I think because of the Elizarov technique and this very aggressive resection, of devitalized bone, the incidence of osteomyelitis, um, be it acute or chronic, is actually much lower in our hands than I think in other groups in the US, and I think the same is definitely true with you. So <clears throat> one question I have for you is, we find that in the United States, um, the Elizarov technique is almost a dying art, at least in the US. Uh, most orthopedic surgeons are, are no longer being trained by experts in the Elizarov technique, Many of them um, are very comfortable doing IM nails and doing basic external fixation, but not really complex bone transport. Um, and so as such, we, we are concerned about the future of lower extremity salvage in the, in the US because even though as plastic surgeons, we have the ability to bring in new tissue with regards to coverage, we may not have the expertise on the orthopedic side to continue doing these complex bone transports. Can you tell us a little bit about Italy and Europe in general about the overall landscape of the Elizarov technique and if it's in decline or, or people are still learning how to do these across the across the continent. Okay, I can tell you that uh, in Italy, Italy was the first country uh, that uh, adopted the Elizarov system, uh, especially people from uh, northern Italy, Lecco and uh, in some parts of, of northern Italy, they went uh, listening uh, to these uh, fantastic results, went to Russia. To, to see the system. Yep. So when they, they went back with the system, uh, we understood that it was a comprehensive system uh, uh, really to um, cover the problem of bone, but also of soft tissue. Because while lengthening uh, and distracting, you can also get some soft tissue repair, as, as it was well shown by Elizarov and all the people publishing series on this. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a very holistic way of uh, treating. And and uh, the advantages in, in, uh, uh, in comparison with uh, nailing or uh, monoaxial is that the, the ring system allow you a really three-dimensional way of, uh, of uh, treating the bone. Because you, you, sometimes you may, may end with a, an ill tibia, an ill femur with, with torsional defects. While if you use a circular system, you can... You can uh, have a look and uh, treat the, uh, the, the, while the bone is healing because you, you really modify uh, the, the, the system during the treatment. And I tell you, in this moment, uh, the system is still uh, alive and uh, um, some new systems, uh, of course, not the original one by Lizarov, are very difficult to be used. So you, you have to be expert in this, are uh, used for tridimensional um, reconstructions or three-dimensional corrections 
uh, kind of compute uh, assess system that so it's really difficult to uh, to mount uh, this uh, uh, tridimensional system with, with difficult bars that can modify in three planes uh, while healing. So you can do compactotomy at the same time, uh, correct all the torsional problems. So in, in the moment in Italy and Europe, uh, these new systems uh, uh, adopting the Lizar of concepts anyway are really very much used. That's uh, that's great to hear because I think <clears throat> the the proper use of the Elizarov technique and even the Taylor spatial frames, I think it is not easy. It is a very um, high level skill and not every orthopedic surgeon um, has that skill. So it's, it's great to hear that, that that's alive and well um, with the younger generations. I think our concern in the US, as I mentioned, is that a lot of the younger surgeons are not simply not being trained in this. And, you know, our orthopedic colleague, Dr. David Lohenberg, you know, went to Russia and Siberia and actually trained for a significant amount of time with the Lazarov. Um, and we, we hope he never retires. <laughs> the other um, comment I had was about, uh, it kind of dovetails on, on this concept. In the US, um, I, I feel that many um, patients are undergoing a below knee amputation um, instead of, of having these more kind of heroic type uh, salvage attempts. And the the excuse or the reason that's oftentimes used is that a BKA prosthesis works very well. After all, you know, Oscar Pistorius ran in the Olympics with one, you know, all this kind of stuff. However, our thought is, you know, I've never seen an 85 year old uh, wearing a BKA prosthesis, but I've seen an 85 year old walking on his or her own foot that's been reconstructed. So I think that while a BKA prosthesis may work well for a young patient, we don't know the longevity of that. and 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 we don't think that um, a, a patient who gets a prosthesis now potentially is going to be wearing that um, all the way into late age. And I, I'm wondering, I was wondering if you have any comments and thoughts as to the BKA prosthesis um, versus obviously being able to salvage your own leg with autologous techniques. Okay. In, in fact, my comment and the first slides uh, I really pointed out this uh, is uh, to give the current indication from the very beginning. So in fact, the decision is to amputate, to reconstruct, is a difficult uh, uh, decision. And uh, th that decision is not to be given by a very young uh, resident uh, in the emergency department, but by the white hair colleague. So you have to ask if you are not sure, because this uh, is really crucial for, for the life of the patient, for all the, the, the following system. So if you, it, it is true that, uh, I told you that uh, the, the social cost, the number of, of uh, procedures, the hospital rest will be, uh, uh, of course, uh, important if you try to reconstruct. But then please use a correct way of thinking. So just not uh, expertise, but also some system as the one we published as the MESS system, because this may, may give you the future of the patient, because it, it is not true that uh, procedures are perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. If you if you if you know or and, and you see patients, a lot of patients they have problems with prosthesis because mm -hmm. they they have uh, uh, skin problems because they wear uh, not perfect prosthesis and not all the people can uh, can afford economically afford a very high quality prosthesis. Let, let's talk about 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 uh, poor people. They cannot afford those prosthesis. Yes, they used for yeah. Olympic games, but not all the people, not all the people, is an Olympic uh, uh, guy. So generally, uh, uh, also prosthesis. And, and if you have a problem during the, during the night, you have to wake up, listen, uh, thinking that you have to wear your prosthesis, and then <laughs> get some, somewhere. So of course, you yeah. have to really decide from the beginning if you are trying to reconstruct some, something that will give you a lot of problems then indication is crucial. You know, it, it's so funny you, you mentioned that. One of my partners, Rudy Buntik, always says, can you imagine an 85-year-old in the middle of the night wanting to go to the bathroom, getting yeah. up and trying to find his or her prosthesis to put on to walk a few steps to the bathroom? And that's why I laughed when you mentioned that because Rudy always says the same thing. I think that um, we're our philosophies are very much aligned. I think that the, in the short term, clearly complex limb salvage is more costly than doing a below knee um, uh, amputation, but there's no question in my mind that in the long term, the longevity is much better, assuming you can salvage it. And if, in a younger patient, especially 20s, 30s, 40s, they may have 40, 50, 60 years ahead of them 
Um, and so to me, um, you know, there's no question that, that you know, if, if it's doable, um, clearly the longevity is better to be able to salvage their own, their own leg for the reasons that you mentioned as well. But Bob, okay, I tell you, even economically, because if you have a, a 25 guy, he will change his procedures several times. Oh, yeah. And this means sure. a lot of costs for the society. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, while, uh, of course, uh, if you do a good reconstruction, uh, mm -hmm. the, the patient will, will be back uh, with his own, own leg. So, so even economically, you have to consider. So if you want yeah. to make your, your life easier, then you amputate, of yes. course. But, but if you look at the patients, you have to consider patient problems. Yeah, no, I, the only uh, the economic comment that I made was only in the short term. It may appear that in the short term, it's it's less expensive to do a, pro, a prosthesis and whatever, but in the long term, it clearly is more expensive because these patients need to have re revisions done to their, their, their residual limb. They need to have the prosthesis replaced. So there's no question that long term, that's actually a more expensive um, prospect. The um, one question I had for you is, um, there's always questions about the limits of bone transport. And obviously it's, it's hard to know an exact number. And, and we've had cases with Dave Lohenberg where he's transported up to 20 centimeters sometimes in the right patient. Um, any thoughts on the limits of bone transport and, and either from a, a length of bone or from a soft tissue uh, standpoint? Well, I tell you, that I, I'm a microsurgeon, so I, when I have big bone loss, I was discussing with, with my uh, uh, good um, uh, uh, surgeon, orthopedic surgeon doing a fantastic Lizarov, and we discussed a lot. It's, I think that it's not a problem of length. So they say if you have uh, six to eight centimeters, then up to six, eight, Elizarov uh, is good. And if you have a 10, 12, then do a, a bone transfer of a free, free fibula or something like that. It's just, it's, it is not just a problem of length. It's a problem of uh, also of the site. Uh, a circular system in the femur is not so well tolerated. In the leg is uh, much better. Yep. So it depends on the site. It's not just a problem of, of length. And also uh, on the quality uh, of, the, uh, of the bone that you are transferring. So mm -hmm. if, if you have a young patient, the, the, the bone transfer and bone healing will be, will be good. In, a, in, a, in aged patients, uh, uh, they are not so well tolerated. And, uh, and if you weigh the, the bone healing in, in this uh, callous distraction, it, it, it needs a very, very long times. Yeah. And I think um, I would definitely agree with that. And the other comment that I want to make is it was really good to see that um, uh, all the cases that you showed with muscle flaps. Um, we love muscle flaps. We continue to do muscle flaps for lower extremity. We think it's, it's fantastic. We do everything from small muscle flaps like gracilis or even the tiny little partial muscle uh, to latissimus serratus combinations and that kind of stuff. Um, and I think the other trend in the U.S. is for skin flaps. And there are studies that people use to back up that, you know, the infection rates are no different using skin or muscle. Um, we just believe that muscle contours very nicely. Muscle is very reliable. The pedicle is reliable. It's large. It's, and and um, we, we continue to use a lot of muscle for lower extremity. And it's really good to see your cases because it appears that your philosophy is also the same. I tell you that uh, uh, as there is no evidence-based medicine on the fact that uh, muscle is better than fascia cutaneous on uh, infection yeah. treatment. Uh, mm -hmm. So I like fascia cutaneous flaps, but the problem is the muscle can feel the holes. Yes. So when you, when you, when you have uh, problems of uh, mangled limbs, you have big holes. Yes. And also, if you leave uh, pressure cutaneous, if you leave some uh, uh, space, that, that will mean hematoma and a problem of uh, perhaps not filling the hole. That mm -hmm. is the problem for the infection rate. Yes. And I think the other thing is from a geometric standpoint, if you have a defect that is not just circumferential, but even, you know, maybe, you know, half the way around, so you're following the curve of the leg, if fascicutaneous flap, because of the thickness of the skin, you need a lot more flap than you think because you have to yeah. follow the curve around the tibia and back. And <clears throat> a lot of patients, at least in the U.S., their, their skin flaps are on the thicker side. So you will harvest a, a, a big fascicutaneous flap and you still have to skin graft around the sides of it because you weren't able to get skin-to-skin -skin closure. 
Um, and the muscle, as you said, just contours nicely. It fills the holes. It can wrap around the whole uh, lower leg very nicely. So really, really good to see that. Bruno, um, thank you so much. It's been such an honor and a pleasure to have you. It's a really amazing talk, and I'm, I'm very excited about having it in our series for residents and, and attendings and microsurgeons and orthopedic surgeons to watch in the future because I think it's an important topic. Um, and on a personal note, uh, thanks again for um, hosting me so generously when I was in Torino. It was a lot of fun, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in person soon. Okay, it was a pleasure for me and an honor to be part of these uh, uh, kind of webinars. And uh, uh, I hope to come to visit you as soon as possible, COVID uh, uh, allowing the, the problem. And if, if not, uh, we'll be really happy to, to have you back again. Okay, thanks a lot, Bobak. Thank you so much and say hi to everyone at CTO for me. Okay, bye. Yeah, bye, -bye. bye everybody. Ciao.